for me, my focus and start in collecting art is American Regionalist Art, and this program tonight is kind of exciting for me because it hits my sweet spot. And the prints we're going to see later, I believe, are some of the finest work I've seen in Nelson's collection. Some people would probably argue with me on that, but that's my opinion. With that being said, I don't know who's going to start. Kate hey, Crawford. Everybody knows her. Loves her. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> And I feel like everybody sat down, and I'll say, you should probably get back. <laughs> um, because we have a small group, and so that's great. Interject if you have questions, and it will be great to be able to let people look as we're sort of talking about individual things moving down the table. Um, so we're going to head upstairs after this and take a tour, have a conversation about the 1930s in print, a gift to Kansas City from the Woodcut Society which is a small exhibition from our permanent collection that I am the curator of. Um, and it contains about 30 wood cuts, wood engravings and line of cuts from the 1930s that were actually given to the museum very early in its history. There was a large group given in um, 1935 and then a smaller sort of supplementary group given in 1939. And this is a group of wood cuts, wood engravings and line of cuts that had really intrigued a number of curators before my time here. Beth Lurie was very interested in this material, as was Stephanie Knapp. And so when I came to the museum three years ago, and was tasked with, among other things, working on exhibitions in that American um, Works on Paper Gallery, Permanent Collection Gallery, um, this was one of the shows that I started to think about. But it's a complex body of work for a lot of different reasons. They're really exceptional prints, as John said. And John and Carl are both Woodcut Society experts as well, so I hope they'll interject. Uh, it, it's an exceptional body of work, but there are a number of artists represented who are not particularly well known, and the Woodcut Society itself is not particularly well known. It really hasn't been particularly well researched. And so what I found was that a number of things in the Spencer Art Reference Library could really begin to help me crack open the story of the Woodcut Society, and I'm just going to walk you through some of those tonight. Um, and it's a story that really begins with Alfred Fowler, who's the founder of the Woodcut Society. Um, Fowler is somebody who's really invested in woodcuts from the 1920s on. And the Woodcut Society is certainly not his first endeavor in the world of woodcuts. He's been working on this for a very long time. And so I, I'm sort of gesturing behind me, but I will hold up for you the Woodcut Annual for 1925, which is a Fowler production, self-published. Um, and he's putting together these Woodcut Annuals, really uh, soliciting contributions from major scholars on woodcuts, wood engravings, and line of cuts, as well as works by contemporary printmakers. And I say that holding this up because this is a piece by Walter um, Joseph Phillips, who's an artist who, <laughs> 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 and please interject, John, but um, Walter Joseph Phillips is an artist who produces one of the earliest commissioned prints um, done by the Woodcut Society in the 1930s. He's a 32 print, actually. It's the second print. Um, looking to you for confirmation. No, no. <laughs> I don't know the why. piece is wonderful. I mean, um, it's wonderful. It's, it's really wonderful. And we'll talk about that because it's wonderful and interesting for a number of ways. But I love seeing this Walter Joseph Phillips here as a frontispiece to the um, Woodcut Annual for 1925 because this is Walter Joseph Phillips working in color woodcut before he moved to black and white in the 1930s. And so you have Fowler following the careers of these artists who may be somewhat less known today, not so much in the case of Walter Joseph Phillips, but in some of the other artists who are represented. And he's really maintaining friendships with these artists, maintaining friendships with print curators, um, maintaining friendships with other print enthusiasts, including authors and cultural figures who are engaged in the print world. Mm -hmm. And it's really sort of serving as a, a place where all of this information can be pulled together to create a community around woodcuts, wood engravings, and line of cuts, really, really printmaking in the 20s and then into the 30s with the Woodcut Society. Um, so I will point out a couple of additional things. There's not a Charles Wilkinson in the exhibition upstairs, but we do have Charles Wilkinson prints in the Nelson Atkins group of Woodcut Society prints, and you've got Wilkinson represented in this 1925 edition. Um, you've also got uh, Lucien Pissarro here represented, which is in the Nelson Atkins collection as well. Um, 
Who else do I have? Oh yeah, Marguerite Kellett Carthana and Elizabeth Norton, who's represented with very different work in the show upstairs, but is being collected here by Fowler in the mid-20s. Oh, and then this, um, J.J. Lang, who we'll get to more about in a minute, is actually in this print, Tranquility House, creating a print of Alfred Fowler's house. <laughs> Fowler is developing really close relationships with a number of these artists um, in the 20s and is pulling together information about both historic woodcut and contemporary woodcut. So again, I say really creating a community. Kate, one of the things that I was really impressed yeah. with when, when you talk about him establishing this network of scholars and artists and, and academics, I, I think what really surprised me is it was a global network. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people think of the Kansas City, uh, the Woodcut Society as a Kansas City entity. Well, it's focused here and founded here, but to think of him communicating with these people in England and Europe and Australia in the 20s and 30s, and we think about just picking up our cell phone and calling or getting on the internet and sending an email, but back mm -hmm. in the 20s and 30s to maintain these relationships required pen to paper. And some of the prints went out during the war. So how did you get these things to go across the Pacific? Because one of the artists was Australian, and get the artwork here. So I, that, that really fascinated me about Fowler was what a global network he maintained in that time period. Absolutely, it's not a Kansas City based. I mean, he's Kansas City based, but it's not a Kansas City based institution. One of the things I learned, um, just to jump ahead a little bit, even from the Woodcut Bulletins, which I don't think exists anywhere else. I think the Center Art Reference uh, Library is the only place. Seven libraries. Who you can be. <laughs> There is a bibliographic listing in WorldCast, the world's largest bibliographic network, so which libraries belong to. There are seven which report having it, but not, but they say, I didn't bother to check the, the holdings. In other words, this is very rare. I mean, seven it may not be only here. <laughs> out of billions of bibliographic records. This is very rare. And as John said, it, it is ephemera, so I think, you know, some of these might have been disposed of. They were really just keeping the 200 or so members of the Wake Society apprised of the goings on. Um, but in one of the early bulletins, you realize that the vice director for exhibitions of the Wake Society in 33 is actually living in New York City. So not quite global, although the artists are on a global reach. But you really have Fowler working with people all across the country to sort of organize these commission prints and then also the exhibitions that the Woodcut Society pulls together. Um, and he's also working with a, a truly global network of artists and scholars. In fact, uh, the print curators, both at the British Museum and the Victorian Albert Museum, are writing essays for the folios in which his commission prints are distributed in the 30s. Hmm. So he's reaching out to this network very broadly. And he's doing that as early as the 20s, which I think is interesting. Before the Woodcut Society, you have at the end of this um, Woodcut Annual, the list of contemporary woodcuts for 1924. And so he's distributing this publication to artists and asking them to send information about what they're producing annually. So he's sort of meticulously cultivating this network by which he then founds the Woodcut Society. And then we have the Woodcut Bulletins, which are either rare or exclusively here. <laughs> <laughs> I just find that in World Cat, Marilyn, but I believe you. Um, these were actually unearthed in Beth Lurie's office when she oh was the museum, gosh. which I think is astonishing and wonderful that they then were able to land in their proper home in the Spencer Art Reference Library. Uh, but these are a wonderful <laughs> sort of guide to the annual activities of the Woodcut Society. And I think it was these bulletins that really helped me understand the full reach of what the society is doing. And you'll be able to see that in the prints upstairs. They're not only commissioning two prints annually, in addition to 200, but they're also circulating an exhibition annually. And each of those exhibitions contains about 100 prints and travels coast to coast within the United <coughs> States. Really travels very extensively and showcases works of art by a much broader range of printmakers than the commission prints obviously can. And what you see, I think, as the commission prints evolve is that those early commission prints are being produced by people like 
J.J. Lang and Walter Joseph Phillips, good friends of Fowler, as they move on, they're being drawn from that body of artists who are contributing to those exhibitions. So you really begin to see the, the way that the society is cultivating its body of artists that it's been distributing works by. Um, in addition to that, the society had a third aim, third ambition, which was to develop a collection for a museum. They were really looking to build a permanent collection of woodcuts for a museum. I think for most of the time that they were working on this, they were thinking of the Nelson Atkins. Fowler was really thinking of his local museum. The Nelson Atkins also opened those exhibitions every year. Um, and he hoped to develop what actually John Bender, who we'll segue to, Bender's a friend of Fowler's, what Bender characterizes as sort of the um, comprehensive collection of woodcuts to uh, display what woodcut is in that contemporary moment, what woodcut is in the 1930s. Bender really wishes this existed for 15th century woodcuts, for instance. Thinks, oh, if somebody had had the presence of mind to do this with the historical works that I'm so interested in, it would be such an incredible resource today. And so he and Fowler are really looking to cultivate that for their contemporary moment. Um, so where did it go? Much of the collection came here. I think <laughs> it's complicated, and I, it, these are just ongoing questions for me, they're great questions for me. Um, that's complicated by the fact that in 39, I believe, Fowler leaves Kansas City. Is that the right date, Carl? Okay. It's, it's 39 or 40. We'll go with 39. <laughs> um, Fowler moves away from Kansas City. So in 35, a number of those prints that are being circulated in the exhibitions are given to the Nelson Atkins. More are given in 1939. But I started to wonder whether when Fowler moved to Alexandria, Virginia, Cedar Rapids, I've been looking around the places that he lived subsequent to mm -hmm. Kansas City, if he continued collecting those prints, and, or collecting prints generally, and gave them to another institution. I haven't found anything yet. And the bulletins only go through 1936. So we have a sense of the activity of this society through 1936, but it's a little bit more difficult to trace after. There are some news accounts, and there are, again, I point at John, because our show goes through 39. Um, the society continues in other geographic locations. There are continue to be commissioned prints and accompanying folios, but it's a bit more difficult to trace the activity of the society, particularly because Fowler is so interested in the world of printmaking in so many different ways. Mm. Um, he had multiple print-related societies that he ran. I think the miniature, the miniature print, print, print society, print society and then he found later in the 30s. Print connoisseur society. I think <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> yeah, so he was trying to distribute <laughs> prints for all these societies, and I don't know how he did it. They become revealed. I think he's part of it. He never seems to have, and we're just debating this, he never seems to have 200 subscribers, which is, I think, the number of good prints he's looking to have in each edition. Um, and so if, as the 30s move on, like, as the 30s wear on, he begins to create deals for his subscribers. <laughs> well, if you join the Miniature Print Society, we'll send you some back stock from the Woodcut Society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's very entrepreneurial in that way. Um, Sounds like us. <laughs> in, the, in the 20s, he's also very invested in book plates. And I think that's how he comes to this community of um, Woodcut artists, really, is through book plates. And we can get to J.J. Lang who is a book, a book plate maker himself. And so I think some of those relationships are being developed by way of the book plate society, which is one of his first. And actually, when you get up here, like has um, a book plate for Fowler in this volume. So these bulletins are incredible for a number of ways. You really get a sense of the activities of the Woodcut Society. But there are also things like a list of prints in the second circulated exhibition, which is really interesting because it, that doesn't exist anywhere else that I know of, although it may, but I looked through World Cup, Yale, it said LC. This is? Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's great. <laughs> um, but the catalog, I haven't been able to find the catalog of this exhibition. So even having a list of the prints that were in this oh. exhibition is very useful because this corresponds to so much of what's in that 212 prints in the Nelson Atkins permanent collection. So you can almost begin to reconstruct the exhibition that the Woodcut Society is circulating. It's not perfect because Fowler didn't actually set aside a copy of every print in these shows for the collection. You don't get everything. And some of the bigger artists that he's taking prints from, including Claire Layton, aren't sending two prints 
so one can be set aside for the society, but a number of the artists are. And so you can actually begin to reconstruct those exhibitions through our permanent collection. So when it was traveling, the exhibition went up traveling, did it go to art museums or did it, you know, back in those days, go to libraries and any, any place? They went primarily to art museums and galleries. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know the Art Institute of Chicago always took them. Uh, there are some institutions, it becomes clear to me just from reading in this, and part of my goal with this was just to understand what would cut is in the 1930s. Because that's a challenge, not necessarily what we think of as wood cut today, and I can talk about that a little bit more as we get to the artist book. Um, what wood cut is in the 1930s and what the community is surrounding those printmakers? What are the venues for displaying prints in the 30s? Um, there are some museums that are much more committed to that in that moment, and the Art Institute of Chicago is one. Mm -hmm. uh, but and it, the institutions shift year to year, and John or Carl, jump in if you have more to add. Um, the institutions shift year to year, but it, they always travel close. Yeah. It's interesting to note that during that time period there were other societies that had traveling exhibitions as well, like the Prairie yeah. Printmakers, Chicago Society of Veterans had mm -hmm. traveling shows, there were a few others. So it seemed to be the trend for these for prints to, to travel nationally. So, so it wasn't certain institutions certain is institutions. what it seems like. Some went to libraries, I think. I know mm -hmm. the uh, Chicago Society of Etchers had pieces in libraries in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. But um, it was a very common practice, so it wasn't just limited to the, the Woodcut Society. Right. And it's interesting, too, or something that I've been interested in, and this is worthwhile in the context of Walter Joseph Phillips in particular, that in the 20s, a lot of the prints that were traveling by way of those societies were actually segregated, black and white and color. And so something Fowler is doing that's very interesting in the Woodcut Society is integrating the work of printmakers who are using black and white as those who are working in color, which does not seem revolutionary to us today by any means, but I think really was in that moment. So printmaking traditions were really seen as being in conflict in some instances. Um, So the Spencer Art Reference Library collection allowed me to begin to see this network emerging between Fowler and these artists, between the Woodcut Society and some of the artists whose work is represented in the body of 212 prints here at Nelson and Atkins. And I moved over there because J.J. Lanks is an important part of that, but I have to then back up to the Woodcut Bulletin because when I'm reading the Woodcut Bulletin for 1932, the second bulletin, I believe, it promotes a woodcut manual, which is J.J. Lang's publication, which we have here, actually from the John Bender Library, that's published in 1932. So Fowler is leaning heavily on Lang. Lang produces the first commissioned print for the Woodcut Society, which we'll see upstairs, but I have an image of here. And he's also promoting Lang's volume, a woodcut manual. And this is a really fascinating book, not only because J.J. Lang has an incredible personality, uh, but also because of how it's introducing readers to Woodcut as compared to the way Fowler wants it to be used. Fowler really thinks this is a volume for anybody interested in Woodcuts, wood engraving, or line of cuts. This is a volume for enthusiasts. Whereas Lang is really aiming this volume at amateur printmakers. And so it's interesting to see where you land in between. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit hard to use, I think, in either regard, but also very useful for understanding the transition that this medium is undergoing in the 1930s. And it really is, um, for a variety of reasons. Length has a very particular take on color print, on printing in color as opposed to printing in black and white. He's really not interested in color printmaking and kind of thinks it's a degenerate art in the United States. He thinks, he thinks that... Western printmakers will never be able to rival Japanese printmakers in color printmaking, and so they should essentially stop trying. It's kind of interesting <laughs> <laughs> in this book. Um, Walter Justice Phillips would not agree. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. and I, I don't think Fowler would either. And so I pulled out um, uh, Walter Justice Phillips' manual on color wood cutting from the 1920s, just by way of contrast. Um, <laughs> he, thinks, he thinks Western printmakers sh shouldn't be working in color. Um, he sort of moves through a variety of tools that you can use for printmaking. It really is a how-to manual. Where you can order your gouges from, where you can order gravers from, where you can order your blocks from, um, where you can get a bundle of Japanese paper that's great for home printmaking for $1.25. 
it's, a, it's an incredible resource. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, I wish, I wish we could go back and do that, um, as well as examples of his own work. But he's doing this with addresses to contact these organizations <laughs> that provide the best printmaking tools. Um, so again, I feel like this is contributing to creating of that kind of community of printmakers. It also suggests how accessible wood, cut, wood engraving and lino cut is compared to other printmaking processes and how important that is in the 30s. Because you also get the sense that Lance is talking to artists who are turning to really printmaking in that moment because they can't afford to do other things. So he talks about things like having previously made prints with shoe polish on paper that was used to wrap bread in the 20s and how that was one of his preferred methods for making prints which is hard to imagine for an artist as well known as J.J. Lang. Uh, but the accessibility of the materials really yeah, comes through. Yeah. And the depression is easily read between the lines in this volume um, as he's talking about turning to wood cutting. You also, from this volume, I think, can begin to reconstruct, as I was saying, the relationship between Fowler and an artist like Lang by way of his work with book plate. Um, and then... It was interesting for me to then see Genevieve Taggart having a book plate created by Lance in this volume as well, because she's actually the sort of poet and cultural critic who writes the first F who writes the essay that accompanies Lance's print for the Woodcut Society in 1932. So not only is Fowler um, reaching printmakers through this relationship, but then also the authors who are offering the essays that accompany the print for the Woodcut Society. So you kind of see how he's just building a network of relationships. Yeah, and it's hard to unpick these relationships because nobody's really worked on the Woodcut Society. Now, Corey Sherman North is, John is, and Carl has, but I feel like we're, we're really it. Yeah. Is there anybody else you? I, you know, you don't come across any, any doctoral dissertations when you're looking. You no. don't come across any, any academic research or publications on the Woodcut Society. We're just starting to unpick this knot. And so it's interesting to begin to understand these relationships. Again, as I said, um, as a Fowler book plate. And then there are also just wonderful things, if you're a lover of prints in this book, that should not be missed. As I said, Lance has an incredible personality. He has um, don'ts at the end of this book, for instance. Don'ts for print lovers, don'ts for framers and matters, to the shipper, to the exhibitor. <laughs> Give it all on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, somebody needs to. Needs Don't to touch the again. face of prints. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, don't roll prints to face framers and matters. To the artist, don't touch the face of prints. <laughs> don't fail to check up on references when they're given by an unknown person. <laughs> so he's really um, giving practical advice, I think, within this as well, as much as you can figure out about the network of artists within which he's working. Um, and again, advertised in the Woodcut Bulletin, so you begin to see how these artists are working together. Um, I've also pulled another volume from 1932. This is Claire Layton's Wood Engravings and Woodcuts. This is not directly advertised with the society, though Claire Layton's a very active exhibitor, um, both in the exhibitions and then also in, is, a, is somebody from whom the society is commissioning prints. Um, but I think this volume is incredible because it further unpicks that network um, of artists who are sort of all corresponding as printmakers in this moment. shows you how widely it spreads. Um, and one thing I call attention to is that an artist who I didn't know a lot about until I was working on this show, Maya May Smith, actually has a piece featured as an example, an exceptional example of use of the multiple tool in wood engraving on the same page as a Berger Sunset River Nocturne. And so an artist who I think most of us are probably much more familiar with, um, being used as a clear contrast with a woman who we're much less familiar with, but she's as well known in this moment and is a friend of Claire Layton's as is Berger Sunset. So, again, kind of getting a sense of those connections through these volumes. I will say this is also an incredible volume for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that it features reproductions of great prints from this moment. Um, Claire Layton also takes, this is really a how-to as well, um, sort of a guide for creating prints, and she takes photos, has somebody take photos of her pulling prints, um, and really going through the steps of creating a wood engraving which is incredible if you're just trying to understand process, which was really something I was up against as I was starting to work on this show. Um, there is also, this book is also wonderful to read in conversation with J.J. Lang's volume because, again, you get a sense of how the medium's evolving in this moment. Lang has one way of defining 
woodcut versus wood engraving, and ultimately he sees woodcut and wood, wood engraving as a superficial distinction. He really thinks they're all woodcuts, one and the same. And he talks about using, in particular, end grain blocks of wood to create woodcuts, using end grain blocks of wood with gouges. That's how he likes to make prints sometimes. Whereas Claire Layton has a very clear distinction between woodcut and wood engraving, and she sees herself as a wood engraver. And it, what's amazing to me is, perhaps not surprising, but still amazing, is if I look at their prints, their sort of feelings about this become so obvious visually. Um, it also undermines the medium line in a number of my labels, but that's okay. <laughs> 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 and so, so before I hand it over to Marilyn, I'll call attention to a couple of artist books I've set out down here, um, including The Farmer's Year by Claire Layton, which is just a beautiful volume unto itself, but is also another cool example of these connections, because two of the prints in The Farmer's Year, Apple Picking and Threshing, were actually featured in the Second Woodcut Society exhibition. So, again, you see Fowler really getting the best of the best. It's being featured in a number of venues. This book is published in 32, I believe? 33. Um, and in that second book, it's a exhibition as well. These prints are featured. Um, something else that was really an important theme for the show that I'll just mention in the context of these two volumes in particular, this is an artist book, very small artist book by Helen Buck Teller, where she pairs. <laughs> um, Love it. This is um, William Car Carlos Williams, but she has American authors uh, from Ben Franklin to William Carlos Williams paired with her wood engraving or woodcuts. Um, Could you read us that one? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. And I can pass it around or people can come see it. Many winds flowing edge to edge, their clear edges meeting as though meet thoughts in pity and contention. And it's um, alignment, which I picked because we have another beautiful print of alignment upstairs by Jesse Joe Eckford. Um, through all of this, I get the sense of how integrated word and image are for these artists. They're all, almost all, all, using their woodcuts to illustrate volumes as well as sort of a standalone artistic statement. And there's a lot of contention about that, which is in the Sir Layton's book whether um, woodcut and wood engraving should be standing on its own as an artistic statement or illustrating volume. It's clearly being worked out in this moment. I'm not sure if they've come to any kind of clean conclusion. But at the same time, she's producing volumes like The Farmer's Year, <laughs> where she's writing this text, you know, really a defense of agrarian life in sort of pre-industrial England and creating these beautiful accompanying wood engravings. So understanding some of those connections and how these works are functioning in the 30s was Really, what I was trying to do in the Center of Reference Library Collection, and it was a wonderful resource. I, I, I think that a lot of the artists that did gift prints or commissioned prints um, were known primarily initially as illustrators. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, as I was researching this one as an artist, I'm like, you know, it lists all the books they've illustrated, but here's a standalone print. And mm -hmm. I found that intriguing. The other thing I find interesting about the Woodcut Society is they were in the middle of a major battle in the 30s with the rise of modernism. And so yep. these, these works were very successful and very popular at a time when many people were embracing modernist um, ideals and philosophies. So really, to me, intriguing that these two things are going on at the exact same time. I absolutely agree. And I think along those lines, um, and along the lines of sort of the contention between black and white woodcut and color woodcut being undercut by Fowler and his willingness to show it all, is that he's also embracing modernism, at least with white line wood cut, and we'll see three examples of that upstairs. He's really interested yeah. in at abstract printmaking, or printmaking uh, that pushes it to the sort of edge of abstraction for printmaking in that moment, and is circulating that in his exhibition, as well as, you know, the work of Claire Layton, which is really pushing things politically, or Helen West Teller really pushing things in a Marxist direction, um, or more traditional statements like Walter Joseph Fellows. So Fowler is very open to a really broad spectrum of artists and what they're creating, which is why I think you get such a representative sample of what's happening in the medium in the 30s, which is his stated goal. Yay. <laughs>